talk in this session is about yes this one revisiting randomness extraction and key derivation using the cbc and cascade modes presented by presented by niranjan balachandran Ashinja, Muridul Nandi, Somi Pao. And the speaker is Ashinja. Thank you. Uh, so this talk is uh, about a very old paper in uh, Crypto 2004 on randomness extractor. So let's start. So what is randomness extractor? It is a algorithm that takes a uniformly distributed seed K and a moderately random input M and produces a small output T and uh, we want that this output should be uh, st uh, statistically close to uniform distribution up to some small uh, uh, epsilon. It's well known that uh, universal hashing can give uh, randomness extractor uh, and there, there are several works in this direction starting from uh, the well-known leftover hash lemma. And in this direction, Dodi Satal presented a rehashed version of the leftover hash lemma called, uh, <clears throat> so uh, I call it the leftover hash lemma plus. So this uh, basically shows that if the, your hash function is sufficiently close to a perfectly universal hash function, so by perfectly universal hash function, I mean that this collision probability should be one over two to the n. But here it is slightly more than that. It is uh, more, uh, it is, slightly more than that by epsilon h. So as long as this epsilon h is uh, small and the input has sufficient mean entropy, then the output distribution will be close to uniform distribution. And what we want is that this epsilon h should be much less than one over two to the n. And in this context, uh, Dodis et al said that we can use CBC and cascade to construct the hash functions. So what is CBC? CBC or cipher block chaining is a mode of operation over block ciphers that passes its message in n bit blocks, M1 to ML, and then processes them in an iterated manner. So first the first block is encrypted, then the second block is absorbed and encrypted, and so on, uh, until you do it for the uh, all the blocks. And then finally, we get the output. Okay, so for this talk, we don't really need uh, a description of the block cipher, so we can simply replace it with a random permutation pi. Uh, in the same manner, the cascaded function uh, can also be uh, described, but now with a compression function f that takes two n-bit input and compresses it into an n-bit output. The function is defined uh, analogously, but because we have a bigger input, now we can directly uh, use it use the Merkle diamond paradigm to construct the function. Here K is of course the uh, seed. Okay, so for these two constructions, uh, Dodi Satal gave these two lemmas, which basically, uh, which basically shows that uh, the they are perfectly, uh, they, they are uh, very good universal hash functions with the biasness bounded by L square by two to the two N. And if you, uh, <clears throat> Uh, if you if you can see that uh, for moderately uh, long messages up to two to the n by four, uh, one can get really good extractor extractors from these two uh, hash functions. But the issue is that there is no proof in the paper, and the authors say that the proof will be available in the full version. Uh, but to the best of our knowledge, uh, there is no full version. So. So this is our uh, contribution that a proof of lemma three and four uh, from the crypto paper. And uh, in the course of uh, developing this proof, we found some new insights in the graph-based analysis of CBC and Cascade. So I will uh, try to explain some main points of the proof. Uh, so first let's recall that we want to bound the CBC collision probability. The problem is that for two distinct messages m and m prime of equal length, the probability that the CBC output collides should be upper bounded by one over two to the n plus order of L square by two to the two n. 
as it turns out, this problem has been studied in several uh, other works. Uh, the two most relevant works are uh, as given. So the first one is by Belare et al, who basically show that for any messages of arbitrary length up to L blocks, the um, probability of collision is bounded by a slow growing function of L over two to the N plus some higher order term. But this itself uh, shows that this result cannot be used in our context because uh, the dominating term is too big. Uh, later, uh, Nandi and myself also uh, analyzed the construction and we proved a result for a union of uh, collision events over Q messages. So basically a union over all Q choose two pairs of messages. And we show that this uh, there, there can be a slight improvement in the bound if we uh, analyze this union of events. But the issue is that again, uh, this result is not valid for our context. But again, these two results were for more general cases. But what I'm more interested in is the tool that they uh, use. And this tool is called the structure graph. So what is a structure graph? So recall that an execution of the CBC function is like this. So a structure graph basically collects all the intermediate outputs, y1 to y2, uh, y1 to yl, and then creates an edge, a directed edge, between yi to yi plus one, and label it with the message block mi. So this basically gives a condition between uh, any two vertices, any two uh, adjacent vertices between uh, in the graph, that uh, if, if there is an edge u uh, comma v with a label m, then v is pi of u plus m. Okay, so uh, we can do this uh, for all the edges, uh, for all the um, uh, intermediate outputs, and this basically gives a walk for each message. And now what, what we can do is uh, define any event defined for the CBC function on this graph. So we can embed the event on this structure graph. So for collision, it is a very simple uh, embedding that we just want that the endpoints of any two box should collide, right? So then the probability of collision is actually bounded by the probability that we can realize such a random graph, random structure graph, where the endpoints of two walks will collide. Now to compute this probability, we first have to characterize these structure graphs. And to characterize, the most important parameter is something that uh, Bilari et al called accidents and induced collisions. So what is accident? So suppose we have this uh, subgraph in the structure graph with this condition that all the labels sum to zero. In this special configuration, something interesting happens. So suppose this collision happened first. So y1 to y2 and y3 to y2 collide. This gives us this set of equations. So of course, the pi of y1 plus m1 equals pi of y3 plus m2. And because of the linear relationship and the label sum uh, being 0, we directly get that the second equation is implied by the first equation. That's the reason that we call the first uh, uh, collision is an accident, and the second collision is an induced collision. And Bilari et al. showed that any graph, any structure graph, can be uniquely determined by the set of its accidents and all and the message m and m prime. So our main tool will be to use this idea of uh, uh, bounding the set of all graphs with exactly i accidents that satisfy the collision e event. So this is a modified tool uh, that we proposed in uh, 2016 paper. So we modified that tool a bit. So basically this tool says that you can fix an accident number A according to the need of your bound and just bound all the, all the graphs, all the size of all the graphs sorry, the size of the set of all graphs with exactly i accidents up to that number. And for the for all other cases, you can use a generic result as proved in the previous uh, work. So basically, the problem now reduces to characterizing all these graphs. And for our case, we just need uh, a equals 2. Because as soon as uh, we reach a equals 2, the other term is already much smaller than what we need. So we just have to characterize all the graphs. And what we have to show is that the 
graphs with accident one is bounded by is is upper bounded by one, and the number of graphs with accident two is upper bounded by L square. So as I said, now the problem reduces to characterizing all the graphs with at most two accidents. And in the 2016 paper, we already gave a characterization for one accident graphs. So these are all these three graphs are the only graphs that are possible. And because we add a restriction that the messages should be of equal length, only the graph A11 is possible. The other two graphs require that one of the messages should be bigger than the other. So of course, for accident one, we already have the graph that we need. But this doesn't solve the problem for accident two graphs. In fact, the technique that we used there was quite ad hoc, and it was a really tedious case-by-case uh, -case analysis. So this is not really applicable for accident two. But this gives us an idea about how we can uh, proceed. So especially the A12 and A13 graph, they only differ in the way where there is this, there is this big cycle. And either we exit the cycle or we don't. So we, we, from this, we got this idea of uh, a core. A core is basically a maximal strongly connected component of a structure graph. So if you see here, the core here is this circle. In both the cases, you have a circle. And uh, every, every vertex in this circle is uh, reachable by any other vertex in the circle. So we, we say that, OK, so if you can characterize all the cores of a structure graph, then it would be easier to uh, construct a path from the starting node, from the source node 0, to this uh, core. And further, what we want is that this core should not have too many accidents. Otherwise, uh, whenever we want to reach the core from the starting node, uh, it will add an accident. And that will uh, cause a problem if we are in just this uh, up to accident two uh, graphs uh, setting. So in this setting, we have these four uh, cores. So the first one has zero accidents, because uh, every node has in degree one. The second one has one accident. The third one also has one accident. And the fourth one has one accident and a induced collision. So all the, the square in, in the middle is uh, like each edge is basically an edge. And the outside edge, the curved edges, are just paths. OK, so once we have the course, as I said, we can start from the initial node 0, and we can construct uh, a particular case of uh, a particular example of a graph. So in this example, the first message is, say, uh, starting with a, a prefix p, and then there is one block a. And then it can take, uh, it can use this cycle to uh, traverse as much as it wants, and then it can exit uh, using the label C. While the second message can use uh, the prefix P and then use the label D to end at the same uh, endpoint. And this is exactly uh, the graph A13, and it has accident one and two collisions. But of course, this is not uh, interesting for our case. Because it is uh, uh, it is created by unequal length messages, so an example with equal length messages would be to use this core and do the same kind of traversal, and this will have accident two, number of collisions is three, and you can create it with uh, equal length messages as well. So uh, to finalize, uh, in the paper we came up with 18 non-isomorphic types of accident two graphs. And then we showed that the bound for accident one graph is exactly one. And the bound for uh, accident two graphs is actually a bit less than L square. But yeah, we need L square. So uh, it's, of course, in the big O of L square. And we gave a similar analysis for the cascade construction, which finally uh, proves the lemma three and four from uh, Dodi et al. paper. With this, uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you for the great talk. So is there any question? Thank you for your talk. I just have some naive question. 
uh, maybe the first one is uh, how can you justify there are only 18 type of extent to graph? Uh, so in the paper, we actually prove uh, that these are the only possible graphs. Okay. So, so what we do is we, for each of the core, we show like what is the number of graphs possible. So for each core, we prove that uh, the upper bound on the number of graphs possible. And that like, if you combine everything that gives the, this number, the 18. Okay. And can you take me to extend to the, for a number extend equals to three? Uh, because this works for true, but. I, th I think the general idea will work for three as well, but then again, the analysis seems to be, will, will become tedious, I guess. Yeah. Or yeah. maybe for any of X. Yeah. For, for <laughs> any, for, yeah. Anything that you go beyond two, I, I don't know. But the general idea of core will be useful, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and any questions more? Uh, actually, I also have some nice yeah. questions. So I'm just curious if, what if we, let's also, suppose we prove some theorem that consider the accident with three or more than three, then what kind of application can we consider? So uh, actually we already used uh, accident three, uh, like uh, yeah, accident three graphs, but for, uh, so in one of uh, my other paper on the OMAC, we actually use that, but then we uh, like introduce certain more right. conditions like the graph has no uh, cycle and things like this, which makes the analysis much easier. Uh, so like a simple, case where this can be uh, yeah. interesting, uh, where the number of accident uh, for the general case could be interesting is proving the tight bound for CBC Mac. Say. So CBC Mac, we don't really know if it is birthday bound or not. Birthday bound, by birthday bound, I mean, uh, if there is an L factor there or not. So so that could be an interesting, or any, any construction that is based on CBC, like all the Mac constructions based on CBC, I think you can, uh, so one can read this the L term yeah. in the year 2012. Yeah. Possible. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks again. <laughs> so actually now the next talk is the, the last talk of today. So the talk is about the X DLBG. XDLBG uh, proposed deterministic random BS generator based on any XOF. The talk is given by John Kelsey, Stefan Lux, Stefan Milner, and the presenter is Stefan Lux. Thank you for. Okay, your talk. thank you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there it is. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you for the introduction. So this is the overview over the talk. So first I will elaborate a little bit on the buzzwords given in the title. And then I will go to the kind of core of the paper describing our approach and results. Then I will look at some refinements. Uh, then we, uh, I will provide some concrete proposals that might be ready for standardization. And one uh, table with uh, performance uh, measurements. And eventually, I will conclude and provide an outlook. So what is a ZOF? Uh, ZOF extendable output function is essentially a hash function that provides an infinite number of output bits. And uh, now that's a little bit oversimplified, but so remember a hash function takes an infinite number or arbitrary number of input bits and generates a fixed number n of output bits. And uh, a ZOF can be described as something as a, as a family of hash function, function that takes a length parameter and a string of arbitrary length as the input and generates an output of the specified length, specified by the length parameter. And uh, the important thing here to remember is when you're calling the ZOF with the same input string but different length parameters, then the shorter output will be a prefix of the longer output. Um, otherwise, you can just treat the ZOF as a random oracle with one constraint, the con reconstruction of any real ZOF has a certain security limit. 
uh, usually is based on some some sponge like thing and then you look at the capacity and then you should make sure that you don't claim security beyond beyond half of the capacity but otherwise you can just treat this off as a random oracle or we are doing it anyway. Um, so what is a digital random bit generator? Now, this looks a little bit like a slide on the previous talk. So in, in, in crypto, we need often uniformly distributed random or pseudo-random strings, for example, to generate keys. And what we are doing here is, okay, in reality, we get have some physical random source, uh, like, I don't know, some, uh, we have some camera that takes every few uh, seconds a picture from our lava lamp uh, or something, uh, or uh, Zina diode uh, is probably more realistic. Shall I click here somewhere? Uh, um, uh, never mind. Um, uh, uh, Zina diode uh, or uh, or a Geiger counter measuring the, the time between clicks, something like this. So we have a data blob uh, that is random, and we assume a, a certain amount of min entropy. Shannon, uh, Shannon entropy won't do, by the way. Uh, we assume a certain amount of min entropy, and we feed it into the DRBG, and then we get our pseudo-random strings that we can use for setting up our keys or so. Um, now, there are more details. So uh, uh, DRBG supports, has a fixed size state that it maintains, and it supports three operations. The first one is instantiate, so it takes the data blob, the so-called seed, and generates the initial state. Then we have, well, as you've seen on the previous slide, we are generating pseudo-random uh, uniformly distributed output bits, so this is done by generate, generate, take the state, and generate the output and generates a new state. And then there's the third operation, uh, reseed, that takes the seed, a, a new seed and the state and generates a new state. And uh, we have a requirement on the min entropy. So for instantiate, we require at least H init bit of min entropy. And for reseed, we require at least uh, H reseed uh, bit of min entropy. And why are they, or can they be different, and how should we choose them? This is something we, I will answer in a few minutes in this talk. Um, and of course, the output is distinguishable from, indistinguishable from random. Yeah, and then there's the question, why do we even need receipt? Uh, well, think about it. What could happen is that the internal state, the fine state of the DRBG, is somehow compromised. The adversary just gathers it somehow it's it's through leakage or whatever uh no, that's of course a catastrophe but a requirement for the uh for any drbg is the first thing is the output from previous generate um requests should not be affected so even if the adversary learns the current state previous generate requests should still be indistinguishable from random and but then of course the adversary knows the state we're calling generate it's a deterministic function that turns the state in a new state generating output so the adversary can predict the output the adversary can predict the output but then comes the receipt request to the rescue so there's uh, another blob of random data another seed with a certain amount of min entropy and hopefully the adversary doesn't know the seed and if so then the uh, DRPG recovers uh, from uh, from this disaster and is back to generating random pseudo random bits that are indistinguishable from uh, random. Uh, so the attack model is very simple. The adversary is living either in the real world or in the random world, and we are keeping track of when the DRPG is compromised and when it's not compromised. Um, and in the real world, well, it does just it's, it behaves as uh, as defined in the random world, um, the output from uncompromised generate requests is re replaced by truly random bit. And then the idea is if the adversary can't find this out, then this is the best that we can provide with the DRBG. I mean, we can't do anything about the output from compromised generate requests because the adversary just can compute them. 
Uh, so for the request, uh, so sorry, for the approach, we are looking at two variables, the number R for the number of requests. Essentially, R is the data complexity. Well, um, so requests, every request count and instantiate counts. And oh yeah, you can do uh, instantiate uh, any, at any point of time, not just at the beginning. But at the beginning, you might, the, the first request always is instantiate. Uh, generate or receipt. We're counting the requests. And then, um, oh yeah, and each request is translated into a soft query. One request, one soft query made, well, by the system or by the challenger. And But then the, the ZOF is a public function. The adversary can call the ZOF for herself. So we have the number of Q of direct ZOF queries and this is, as usual, in the random oracle model, this is kind of, you know, the, 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 the query complexity, but you could say this is just an indicator for the runtime the adversary needs. And for the analysis, then, we are defining certain bad events, and we are saying, yeah, the adversary benefits from those bad events. If none of the bad events occurs, then the adversary just can't distinguish real from random. So what bad events are there? I'm simplifying the paper. We have a finer grained notation, but here I'm just looking at three uh, bad events. Um, you could say group of bad events. So the first one is actually two requests have the same input. Um, so um, the worst thing that might happen is, for example, for instantiate, that just by chance you have the same seed twice. And the probability for this to happen is uh, one over two to the h init. Well, remember, h init was the lower bound on the min entropy for instantiate. And when we have, uh, there are other similar issues, but then essentially uh, two states happen to collide or so. But the upper bound for this is essentially a birthday bound, so r square divided by two to the h init. That's the first bad event. The second one, okay, so there's an unknown state and essentially the adversary is trying to guess the unknown state or the adversary is trying to guess the, the unknown seed from instantiate uh, or both. Uh, well, so um, the probability to guess the unknown seed is one over two to the h in it once again, or one over two to the state size, but that's even smaller. And there are at most R requests to guess, and there are Q attempts. So the, the upper bound for the pr probability is Q times R divided by 2 to the H in it. Last but not least, there is also the case where the state has been compromised. And in this case, we are the adversary essentially, I mean, they're the, the um, uh, generate requests. OK, no problem. Or, Actually, it is a problem, but nothing we can solve or do about. But then there is the next uh, receipt, and then the adversary is guessing the seed from receipt, and this happens with probability one over two to the h receipt. And if you're doing it q times, then the upper bound, the probability is q divided by two to the h receipt. And if you put this all together, I'm skipping some minor events, and I'm obviously skipping constant factors, but you get a bound that looks roughly like this. And uh, the interesting part here is now this gives us the relationship between H receipt and H init. Namely, H receipt is actually, it's reason, uh, reasonable to uh, choose it a bit smaller uh, than uh, H init. Essentially, H receipt should be roughly H init minus log two of the number of requests. Now, that means essentially that's the sweet spot where increasing H in it doesn't bring you much more security without also increasing H receipt and vice versa. So that's the sweet spot. Um, so now uh, we're looking at refinements. Yeah, such, an X, such, such a DRBG is probably the identical thing is running on many different devices. So then one device may be compromised, one may not be compromised. Uh, so this is one refinement. Um, Better so, so uh, okay. I hope uh, some, sometimes I seem to make uh, blowing noise. Noise. 
sorry for that. Um, and then the other refinement, there's an additional input for all the requests. Um, we call it alpha. It's a, it's a string, and yeah, we are free to define it whatever we like. Uh -huh. And uh, there could be the, so there we are looking at three um, approaches. The first one is a fixed alpha. This is essentially what we already did. Could be the empty string. So this is the best case for the adversary. It's always the same uh, alpha, so you don't need to worry that your query with one alpha doesn't match a request with another alpha. Um, the second one is uh, the worst for the adversary, that is alpha is an ans. So across all the universe, different devices, within device, the same alpha is never used twice. Now, um, uh, this may be a little bit difficult to implement, and actually, I think uh, NIST is going to remove the requirement for using the use of nonces from uh, SP, whatever number will be shown in a moment. Mm, so a third strategy is personalization. So every device gets an, an, uh, such a string alpha as a kind of name. It can also be chosen at random, no problem. Um, and all requests from the same device are using the same alpha, but requests from different devices will be using different alpha. This is kind of the middle device. And then we're looking at a number of R device of requests from the same device. Um, so the first one is the same as before. For the second one, when we're using nonces, we get that we can actually, so, so what you see is that this um affects the bow the probability bounds for some of the bad events and uh, in the case of the nonces it's actually reasonable to choose h receipt equal to uh, h in it and in the last case personalization then h receipt can again be smaller than h in it but now the difference is log two of our device. So log two of the maximum number of requests from a single device rather than the maximum number of requests all devices together would do, as it is up there in the case of fixed alpha. Uh, so our proposals, uh, we are basing them on Shake from SHA-3 standard and on uh, SCON as the upcoming lightweight standard. So if you look at the first line here, that would be XDRBG128. It has 256 bit of capacity. So claiming more than 128 bit of classical security would make no sense. So we are not doing that. And then our suggestion is to use H init. Uh, so the min entropy for in instantiate calls 192 bit. The min entropy for receipt calls 128 bit. Uh, the number total number of requests this device would ever have to handle on all uh, sorry this the uh, DRBG would ever have to handle all devices that will ever be produced should be no more than two to the 128. Um, and no single device should handle more than uh, two to the 56 requests. Um, and so we are assuming personalization here. And uh, then we get 128-bit uh, classical security, 64-bit quantum security, and this would be NIST category level one. And then you could go to XDRBG192, XDRBG256. So for XDRBG256, we get a nice uh, security where we don't need to require personalization for our results and uh, we get the highest level of uh, post-quantum security in this NIST category. And for SCON, XDRBG L128 is there, again, level one, and with a bit of stretching. So actually, for that purposes, the um, state size of SCON with 320 bit is a bit short, and we had to push it a bit to get beyond uh, level one post-quantum security, but we also have a proposal for level two post-quantum security. Um, okay. So the performance, it's not the most important, I think, for a digital random bit generator because 
you won't take your keys and you're not calling it critically thousands of time when you're doing something that really re requires very quick response from you usually. Um, but anyway, uh, we compared it to SHA-2 based um, uh, random bit generators um, that don't come with a proof of security, by the way. And as, as you see, is the optimized implementation using whatever vector instruction is available on that device uh, is on almost all uh, devices the fastest. And the unoptimized implementation that's not using vector uh, instructions is the second fastest. And so to conclude, the XDRBG is a digital random bit generator, and our approach is very generic. You're not required to use SCON or Shake. You can use whatever um, whatever ZOF you prefer, and you just can plug in uh, our construction. You can just use our bound security bounds to for an estimate for the security bound of your construction, assuming your ZOF is secure, of course. Mm, it has been pre proven secure in the random oracle model, and it, it's actually turned out this, this little trick of personalization, giving each device a unique kind of ID is useful for improved bounds. And last but not least, uh, we expect the shake-based instantiation to match future requirements for standards currently under revision, such that uh, SP800-90 uh, from NIST and AES2031 from BSI. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the enthusiastic talk, Stefan. Uh, and is there any question? This is the last chance of my question today. Uh, thanks for the inspiring talk. So I would like to ask about the, your attack model. So maybe page seven. Yeah, it's yeah. It seems quite natural. And uh, my question is: Is this it new or something uh, um, studied or not? It's uh, somewhat implicit in the related work, but I'm not aware of any work that actually did formalize in, especially did provide a proof of security for existing DRBGs. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of the the way of thinking. I mean, these three instructions here have been out there before. The, we didn't invent it. Mm -hmm. uh, they are in, in uh, SP890 uh, and in AS2031 just as well. Mm -hmm. And they were there because people were thinking along this line. Yeah, okay, thank you. So, and the related question is that a comment is that I say that the receding should be uh, cheaper than the yeah, initial. It, Seeding that's uh, yeah, that's uh, for the practical yeah requirements, I guess. And uh, as you mentioned, yeah, but uh, in the table, the resulting table for the instantiation, I see that some examples of neither the seeding is uh, not cheaper than the initialization, for example. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, to some degree, so uh, the firstly, the the three upper. Uh, entries there have been inspired by the NIST and the BSI standards. And the middle one, so BSI had some preliminary standard, as I understand, who, the, they said, oh yeah, uh, 240 bit min entropy everywhere. So we said, yeah, which, which level of security can we make with this requirement? Mm -hmm. So that where this actually stems from. Maybe BSI thinks twice now and uh, proposes a revision or chooses XDRBG256 or so, but that's where this stems from. Hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. But good question, good point indeed. Yeah. Thank you. So hmm. by default, I would also say a part of our analysis provides a justification to use uh, smaller uh, or to re uh, impose a smaller, lower bound on the min entropy for receipt rather than instantiate. Mm. Yeah. I see. Thank you. And any more question? 
Uh, may I ask one question? So you told that the security model is not uh, previously existed. So yeah, I think there is no concrete consensus about the security model. I guess. Um, good. <laughs> ask around. So my understanding is that at least the authors of this standard did have that security model in the mind. And I don't know otherwise why really the existence of the third operation uh, receipt uh, would even make any sense at all. Why, why do you propose a receipt uh, if you don't? Oh, oh and they uh, informally they say something about recovering from a compromise, state compromise and forward and backward security. The other standard has other names for the same thing. Uh, so this is something that has been established, but as I said, not written, to the best of my knowledge, not written down in a way uh, you need for a security proof. But I think it's mostly agreed on. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks again, Stefan. Mm -hmm. This, I think, concludes the day. Uh, this was the last uh, session for today, so you have free time in the afternoon, but first, have some lunch, please. So.